Welcome to episode four of What's On Your Mind, a new show from the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management, where we'll be talking to the Institute's senior trading mentors about what's been on their mind in the financial markets over the last week. I'm Chris Quill, and today I'm joined by Raj Malhotra and Anthony Iser. And just before we begin with the show, I want to remind you guys watching that if you're interested in learning more about trading or investing, or what the Institute does in general, then you can head over to our website itpm.com and from there you'll find a bunch of different resources and links to further your education. So things like our live upcoming seminars, our online education program, our bite-sized videos and the mentoring programs that we do around the world. So with that being said, let's jump straight back into the show and Anthony, this week we'll start with you. What's been on your mind? Thank you, Chris, and good morning, Raj. Um, couple of quick things to start with, and I think it's always important just to sort of try and set the scene a little bit from a macro perspective and just understand the, the broader context in which we're trying to look, look at things. Uh, and the broad context remains pretty strong. Uh, PMI numbers came out last night. The um, New orders were particularly strong, back up to 65.1, and economic data on the whole in the US continues to look uh, pretty good. You've seen unemployment numbers at sort of record lows. Uh, GDP continues to pick up. Uh, profits remain very high on the back of tax cuts, but just general operating leverage uh, and, and top line growth, uh, margins remain at at very high levels. So things are going broadly very well uh, in the US. So it's, it's important to keep that uh, in mind. Countering that or balancing that out, it's also worth noting where we are in the economic cycle. And we're at the end, somewhere near the end of a 10 year economic cycle. Since 2008, uh, financial crisis, the 2009 lows of March, We've been on a very steady, consistent uptrend and things moving along quite strongly now. Um, so that's so there's a couple of things just to focus on. Uh, and I guess the other sort of bigger picture things that I'm looking at uh, at the moment, lots of discussion about tariffs. Uh, and in very simple terms, tariffs are taxes and there's nothing good about tariffs. Uh, that said, Despite all the noise at the moment, there's really no great impact coming through in terms of numbers. And that may play out over the next six months or so, but uh, I'd rather just sort of wait and see what that impact is going to be before getting too excited about it. And then the final point in terms of the macro scenario at the moment that I'm looking at is the USA versus the rest of the world. Uh, and if you have a look at this chart here from the Wall Street Journal, you'll see the dispersion between share market performance between uh, the US and the rest of the world. That's all the, the world's markets, uh, excluding the US. From the early part of this year, uh, there's been a massive divergence. And there hasn't been a massive divergence in terms of economic performance. So this is something to keep a close eye on. Uh, I know Ross and Chris spoke about it uh, a couple of weeks ago. It is something that will mean revert at some stage. It probably provides a big opportunity. When that happens, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly something to keep front of mind. So that's the big picture macro environment that I'm sort of looking at at the moment. Uh, and fitting into that and fitting into that strength is the broad strength we've seen in, in markets this year and particularly in the FANG stocks, which obviously everyone talks about and almost everyone, if you've got a mutual fund, you certainly hold all five of them. And that's been one of the key drivers. There's been sort of universal strong performance. Uh, if you go and look at the top five or six holders of each of the FANGs, then you'll see that it's basically index funds the whole way through uh, with the odd exception here and there. But basically, uh, you've had a power of money flowing into these stocks, driving them and driving the market. So I thought what I'd look at today uh, and discuss some of the things I've been thinking about is trying to differentiate between them. Uh, the, the performance has been strong, as I said, and the big drivers are the same, but there are 
beginning to become some sort of decent differences between what's going on at the stock level. Uh, and there's a couple of different contexts uh, that I'd look at these. So the first one uh, that I've been looking at uh, is to be short Facebook uh, and long Google. And the reason why we're long and short and the Institute looks strongly towards market neutral positions when we can uh, and intersector like this because it takes out those macro flows to a large degree, it takes out some of those big levers and what's going on within the sectors and we can start looking at the stocks. And I think the differentials between these stocks are starting to sort of open up a little bit now. So Facebook again spoke to uh, Congress in the US overnight, the stock was down, it's been under pressure, but there's a couple of big fundamental things I think. And one is that they've told you that uh, their operational leverage has gone uh, for the next couple of years at least. Costs are going up uh, on the back of the privacy issues that they've had. They've told us that. They couldn't have been more clear. If anything, I think that could probably uh, surprise on, on the upside, that being costs higher than we're expecting them to be. And for the first time in quite a while, uh, revenues growing at a faster rate that, uh, than earnings growth. So that operational leverage has, has disappeared. Uh, Google, on the other hand, has continues to have that operational leverage. They were supposed to appear at these uh, uh, committees uh, last night in the US, uh, but didn't show up. And they may see some pressure. Uh, I know the administration in the US has talked about uh, issues they've got with Google, uh, but there's nothing fundamental coming through, and I don't really see regulation happening. Uh, in this space at all, um, it'll be a little bit of self-regulation like Facebook is doing, uh, but Google, I don't think it's got a great deal to worry about in the short term, but it's an issue that we will want to keep an eye on. Um, the biggest issue I find with Google is this is a company that uh, manages legally to save money for a rainy day, whether that's just spending a little bit more now, uh, knowing that they won't need to in the future, but their earnings are incredibly smooth. They've only had one disappointment in the last three years. So I don't see earnings uh, surprises on the downside. I think they've got a little bit up their sleeve if anything does get a little bit tight or if they do need to push up costs. Uh, the other reason why I think uh, Google stands out, particularly relative to Facebook, is because the value guys in the market, the long-term investors that will tear apart balance sheets and try and analyze what's going on uh, at, uh, at a very deep level are crawling all over Google. And there's lots of investments in various businesses Google's made uh, outside its core businesses that get accounted for in a way uh, that have some of these guys thinking it's trading on a significantly lower multiple than the headline numbers. Uh, and that's simply because uh, there's various things going through expense lines and not capitalizing uh, as other companies would. And again, this is just another way of sort of trying to save things for a rainy day. Uh, so I think you could see real earnings significantly higher for Google. Uh, whereas Facebook, the only upside risk really comes from Instagram. Uh, and they're talking about possible stores within Instagram to take over uh, or compete with Amazon. Yeah, you know, that's a big that's a big ask. So, if we're looking at the fangs and without trying to determine whether as a whole they're going up or down, I think a relative play uh, that I'm certainly going to be looking at would be uh, shorting Facebook uh, and and going long Google on the other side. Uh, the other trade within the fangs that I'm looking at, and again that. The context is slightly different on this one. Uh, as I said, with a macro view, we're somewhere towards the end of an economic cycle. When that rolls over and when the market rolls over, uh, the, the desire for growth and the chase for growth and high earnings dissipates a little bit and people are very, uh, or certainly much more cautious about earnings growth and any disappointment uh, will be sorely uh, felt and uh, expectations get ratcheted back uh, and multiples get ratcheted back and Netflix uh, is actually on a significant multiple uh, which is 
perhaps justified at this point in time. Growth is coming through at a uh, very strong rate, uh, has done for quite some time. Um, but when the market rolls over, when we, when we see that transition, uh, people will wonder whether they should be paying 125 times and whether 70 times is a fair enough price to pay. And if they disappoint uh, and you continue to see earnings downgrades, and we haven't we've seen a downgrade recently, it's still obviously strong growth, but that growth has been ratcheted back a little bit, uh, then you might see that multiple come back. Uh, so they've just had one big earnings miss and subscriber miss, and I don't think they can afford another one. Uh, top line growth is slowing as well. These are all sort of standard issues in this type of market. It doesn't matter too much, but as soon as the, the broader market rolls over, uh, that'll be an issue. But again, we can sit here and try and pick tops and pick bottoms, and uh, it's a very tricky game to play and certainly not one I'm inclined to do. Uh, so I, again, would be looking to have something on the other side of this trade uh, within the FANG sector. Uh, and that stock, I think, is Apple. And again, it's because of this context. I think if we're rolling over, uh, you'll see the strong exit of money from uh, index funds, the whole sector will get sold down. But the marginal buyers and sellers will be the one who determine which stocks perform, perform well. And I think the marginal buyers will be uh, a return to sort of value buying and Apple stands up well on that side. And if you do see the huge outflows from index funds, a massive wall of selling in, in markets at some point in time, Apple's going to have two huge buyers, bigger buyers than any other stock can get. And that's itself via its buyback. And a huge amount of performance has come from its buyback. And the other buyer is Warren Buffett. And you can be sure as the day is long that he will be buying uh, if the market rolls over and he'll be sitting back, he's got hundreds of billions of dollars of cash that he wants to deploy and he's looking for an opportunity. And he, I'm sure he could think of nothing better than seeing Apple uh, falling like a stone. So you'll see lots of support there. Um, so if you have a look at these charts of Apple, uh, one component is its cash balance over time and you'll see how strong that is. And that's what they'll use to fund these buybacks. And then Netflix, on the other hand, uh, has been funding lots of its growth with debt. We've got a chart here as well showing the increases in that debt. And they're using that debt to generate a lot of content to try and take on Disney uh, and fight off Amazon Prime, uh, who is uh, competing aggressively on content as well. Uh, but content funded by debt, again, perfectly okay at the moment, but may come back to bite them. Cool. So, Raj, I know that you've also been looking at tech stocks quite heavily, um, probably also thinking about the, the trade structure of how you might set up some ideas. Do you want to expand on that a little bit as well? So, yeah, I've been looking at uh, tech stocks, amongst other things. And one place I really think I've been, want, I've been dipping, I've been ready to dip my toe in the water in is uh, in this Chinese route. Now, if you look at what's happened historically, when Trump was first elected, the whole the whole country got sold off because of the fear of a trade war. That's happened again here. But I believe that when the when when they stop selling off indiscriminately as a whole, you'll see the cream of the the cream rise to the top. And in this case, I think the place that you want to buy is uh, Alibaba. I mean, if you think about it, a trade war really doesn't affect the person on the ground that's buying their groceries and their um, clothes and whatever they want on Alibaba. Like a guy sitting in Ch Shanghai doesn't really worry about those high level things. He's still buying stuff for himself and his family. So I, if you look at the chart, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I, what I did was I bought the 165, 195 fall spread. Uh, the reason I picked it, the reason I picked that was um, the stock about just about a month ago, topped out close to 190 and, uh, after blowout earnings, and I have no reason to think their earnings won't continue to do well. In in this spread, you get if you buy December, you get the next earnings cycle. I, I paid nine dollars for this spread, and I have an upside of twenty one dollars, so uh, almost a two to two and a half to one payoff if I'm right. And if I'm wrong, I'll just lose my premium. And I'm very comfortable with the risk reward of this trade right here. 
moving on to what something that Anthony said about tech, I believe that um, it makes sense to um, actually hedge your portfolio if you have uh, have had gains this year. Like some of my students, uh, one of my students yesterday emailed me, told me he's up 88% this year. So kudos to you, Bastille. Um But anyway, if, if you've had gains and you've mostly participated through longs or some of the longs have been up a lot, I think it makes sense to put on some portfolio hedges. For example, like going into year end with balls this low um, and with uh, the midterm elections and what the implications of that, which may be impeachment fears, plus kind of went to, to a point that Anthony said about um, tech. You know, for, first, I mean, it's starting to be on the radar of some cracks in that whole sector and, and more specific like antitrust issues. Um, for example, like Facebook and Twitter bar conservative content. There's, I feel like there's a bit of a backlash coming against big tech. For example, I and, and I believe agree fundamentally with Andy said about well, Google. I have no idea what morons run that company when they decided to not show up to Capitol Hill for congressional testimony. We can all agree that the U.S. Congress are a bunch of morons that don't know what they're doing. Having said that, there are morons with unlimited power, so you have to play nice with the morons. Showing up as an empty chair while Sheryl Sandberg sits there and looks nice and speaks eloquently and plays nice and Jack Dorsey who looks very uncomfortable as like a total introvert. But those two showed up and Google with the hubris did not show up. It just doesn't seem like a good move to basically spit in the face of people that have power. And as you know, power, power hungry Napoleonics have are, are going to push you to the limit and they can make your life miserable. So that I don't agree with that decision. So having said that, uh, one, one trade I put, I'm, I'm encouraging a lot of uh, students to put on is a portfolio head just to protect gains. Um, if you look at the chart right here, I'm recommending the 285, 270 put spread, which expires at the end of the year. Um, 270 is basically where the S&P was at the beginning of the year. So if you put this trade on, you could put it on for three bucks to make 12 should the stock, should SPY settle anywhere between 270 or lower by the end of the year. So a four to one payoff is a pretty good risk reward. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the market's gonna sell off. In fact, I think it's probably gonna continue to be strong, but this is called this is called being fiscally responsible, especially if you have a lot of gains that you're trying to protect into the end of the year. So those are two spreads that I've been looking at. And one thing, to one thing to touch back to what Anthony was talking about um, in terms of Facebook, I do believe not only um, what he not only what he said, they're just not growing anymore. And, and Anthony's right about the regulation. It, it feels to me kind of like what uh, Wall Street's had to go through. As soon as they get so big, they it's a bull market in Wall Street in compliance supervision. That's what's going to. It seems to me that's what's coming in social media. It's going to be if you want a job in supervision or compliance that the place to go right now is social media and i fully believe that that's going to be that that that's going to create a job market in that industry and that will actually and like i said before i think some of this backlash against facebook against this banning of conservative content which is not really in the mainstream media but i i'm starting to see it where it's just uh where just the liberal bias is actually going to turn off a lot of the use of a lot of the users in uh, of a different political commentary. So that's another headwind to that stock. Having I said that, I think that's going to take a little longer to uh, hit. But I do think that uh, one trade that makes sense is the um, in Facebook, the 170, 140 put spread in November. You're going to get third quarter conference calls in about five weeks. And, and you saw what the stock did last time, last earnings. I, I believe that that's going to continue. There's no, it, like, it's not that, uh, it's not like their uh, business model is going to change in the last three months. And the backlash of Facebook from all around is probably going to continue. If you put that trade on, uh, basically, if Facebook sells off 15% um, from here, which is a very reasonable um, assumption, if you put that trade on, you could pay 780 to make. 2220, which is almost a three to one payoff in a name which has had some headwinds to it. And I think that that trade structure does make sense here. 
and, then, and and the reason I like to do as a spread rather than outright is you can limit you you limit you limit um, your uh, downside. You know how much you're paying, and you know how much you can make. So it's easier to just track your potential P and L rather than just trade, make it, doing an outright trade or sell on call. And you can reduce the cost of the trade, right? So the the, the risk reward can become better. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. And and, and so there's something more technical I can get to another time with with my students. But because of the way, it's something called the skew, which is basically where uh, where the lower strike puts are a higher vol than the at the money strikes. For example, you kind of take advantage of that by doing premium. And uh, what about aside from some of those tech names? Are there any other um, stock positions that you have been looking at, or maybe even your mentees? Yeah, actually, I'm going to highlight one of some of my mentees, uh, Greg Paul. So one thing that uh, there's a lot of ways to come up with good trade ideas. One thing that uh, I challenge my students to look at is to think outside of just the numbers. Just think of like spending patterns or patterns in the world, or just things they observe, because that is ultimately how. You see these home run trades. So one trade that we've actually, a couple of my students have had on that are younger, younger um, people that are millennials and noticing spending patterns. For example, they we've been long, um, basically uh, low priced stores. Like for example, when I mean like almost like junk stores, like five below, or a store where they everything's under five dollars, or Ollie's, which is another one that where it's just. Where, where, where millennials are cheap, they just go in there. They're, they have no re, they have no interest in going to stores unless it's for a bargain. And in this case, those two stores cater to uh, college students, people where they're just spending money, where they walk, they want to go in with a hundred bucks and walk out with a bunch of crap. So that's actually been, those, those those stocks have been on a roll. Like five below was up from sixty to like. 115. Ollie's, when I first entered it, it was around 35. Now it's about around 85. So those, so it's a, it's a relative value in retail. And on the other side of that, um, a, a name that we've been very short is uh, with LB Limited Brands, which is um, the parent to Victoria's Secret. Now, it's it's shocking that Victoria's Secret's taken such a turn. Maybe it's because Millennials just don't want to be sexy anymore, or they don't realize that the, they think they're object, being objectified by wearing expensive lingerie or hashtag me too or whatever it is. But Victoria's Secret iconic brand is just tremendously under pressure. And I mean, I still like looking at Victoria's Secret models, but I guess it doesn't cost anything. It costs them a lot more than it costs me. So the, the, that that relative trade, that relative value trade has just been a home run. And that's just, I think, goes back to millennial spending patterns. And so I, I challenge anyone out there to look for just basically trying to predict the future of just observing behavior and spending patterns. And that's just been a way that's hasn't been like it, it's not just out. It's, it's not just an apparent trade by looking at data, but that's a, that's a pretty apparent trade by looking at the way people shop and the way people behave. Right, yeah, and I think that's probably something that retail traders don't necessarily realize they can take advantage of is uh, yeah. sort of that ground level, uh, paying attention to sort of street level yeah. research, if you like, what you see, what yeah. you observe. Uh, actually, you know, speaking of it, about that is one thing that's interesting I found this week was uh, one company that tried that was Nike in this um, Tom Kaepernick ad where they're basically pushing him as a uh, sponsor to... To, to you know to target millennials some people have different opinions i think it's i understand why they did it because they think they're getting free um, publicity but i think it's it's going to backfire long term and i really don't understand why they're basically by, by they're basically like splitting the country politically like if you're selling shoes michael jordan famously said this Republic, the reason he doesn't go into politics is because Republicans buy shoes too. So why, why target an ad to basically piss off half of your, you know, half of your buyers? It doesn't make, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, they get free publicity. They say any publicity is good publicity. I think this is bad publicity, but I, that, that's just me. Right, Anthony. Let's um, let's switch back to you for a moment. Um, thinking back to your your trade idea with Apple, 
um, and short Netflix. Uh, one of the one of the concepts behind that was your sort of thesis of coming towards a, a, the end of the business cycle. So as well as looking at sort of intersector tech trades, um, does that present you with opportunities to rotate into other sectors or are there other stocks that you've been looking at? Well, yeah, there are. Um, I will just caution that I'm not sort of trying to pick the top in anything here. As I said up front, the economic data still is very strong and the market uh, uh, is seeing strong earnings growth and numbers broadly across everything. It's just, uh, we, are, we are somewhere near the end of the cycle. But yes, there are. And actually, I was looking at a couple of names that fit into that category, but I wasn't looking at them for that reason. Uh, Walmart, Costco are clearly defensive names that you would look at in a downturn. Uh, but along with Target, I was just looking and they've got very bullish outlooks in terms of what customers are doing, the types of volume growth, uh, revenue growth uh, that they're seeing in terms of foot traffic as well. They've got stock specific issues, um, certainly Target has. Uh, so I wouldn't be sort of rushing out to buy them by any means, but they certainly fit that agenda uh, for when things do roll over. Uh, but I was just looking more from the point of view that, uh, that, that their commentary uh, reflects the strength that we're seeing in the US economy at the moment. And I guess there's probably just one or two other quick one-liners that I'd finish off with um, just to let uh, people know Elon Musk is uh, speaking on Joe Rogan's show at 9 p.m. Thursday night, um, U.S. time. Uh, the whole world investment community will be listening to that. Uh, Musk has been going off tangent, uh, doing things that many people would argue uh, the SEC should be looking at in terms of criminality. Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not even going to comment on Tesla. But if you are involved... Uh, in any way or just curious, you should listen to that show. Uh, and the other th final thing I'd just point out, um, a little bit on the macro side, but the Australian dollar has been under pressure uh, from the trade side of things, uh, uh, particularly because of its exposure to China, although that's less than it, people think it is. I mean, Australia's got huge amounts of tourism and other drivers and it's not quite just digging stuff out of the ground anymore. Uh, and GDP is very strong. And I don't think these are things to watch for. The thing to watch for in Australia is the housing market. Uh, there's been 11 months decline now. Not quite the declines you're seeing in Canada, but you could see those sorts of declines coming through. Lots of interest-only loans uh, to roll off. Uh, that will pressure banks, pressure the consumers. That's the thing to look at. Uh, as Ross pointed out in one of his calls, though, shorting the Australian banks for the last... 25, 30 years has been the widow maker trade. Uh, it looks obvious at times, but never seems to work out. Uh, I'm not going to say this time is different, but uh, for the broader Australian market, that's the thing to look at. Uh, yeah, so I guess there are just a couple of final things that I'll be looking at at the moment. Cool. Um, unfortunately, I think we've run out of time on, on this uh, week's show. So Raj, Anthony, thank you very much for joining me and thanks for sharing your thoughts on this episode of what's on your mind now just before we close the show i want to point out to you guys watching just as a reminder that if you want to learn more about trading and investing or what the institute does in general then just head over to our website itpm.com and from there you'll be able to find all the resources that we have edu educational resources um, links to things like our live upcoming seminars our online courses our bite-sized videos and also the mentoring programs that we do around the world with guys like Raj and Anthony who can really help you develop as a trader. So I hope you enjoyed the show and make sure you join us next time for another episode of What's On Your Mind.